everybody back for another video of lightning fast reviews of each chapter uh, i'm going to shoot for probably chapters 15 through 18 in this one and then there might just be one one left after that but again we'll see how we do time wise um, chapter 15 basically was an extension of chapter 16 but i didn't want to make that last video too long um, chapter 15 dealt with a couple things, one being um, gene mapping. So if you remember, genes that are very close together on the same chromosome can violate Mendel's second law and be linked, meaning that they'll be inherited together uh, more often than, say, genes on different chromosomes. We talk about the recombination frequency of genes on the same chromosome. That basically means how often does crossing over separate them? So genes on different chromosomes are inherited together 50% of the time. Half the time they are, half the time they're not. That's if they're on different chromosomes. If they're on the same chromosome, let's take it to the extreme and say they're at the complete opposite ends of the chromosome. Even uh, though crossing over occurs, they can approach 50% recombination frequency. The closer together they get, the lower that recombination frequency uh, goes. So genes that have a recombination frequency of 10%, means they only separate 10% of the time, uh, are 10 map units apart or 10 centimorgans. Remember, Dr. Morgan did studies with this and they named a unit after them. So every percentage recombination frequency is a map unit apart on the chromosome. So obviously two genes that are 40 map units apart have a 40% recombination frequency. They're further apart than two genes that have a 5% recombination frequency and thus are only five map units apart. We did some problems where if you are told the recombination frequency between different pairs of genes, you could sort of piece the data together and say where they are relative to each other on the chromosome. That's known as a linkage map. So that was part of chapter 15. Um, sex linkage. So genes that are found on either the X or the Y chromosome are said to be sex linked. This goes for traits and or diseases that occur. Um, you remember females have two X chromosomes, males have an X and a Y, which the term for term for genes in a male on the sex chromosomes is hemizygous, right? Because the X and the Y are not homologous. Um, males get sex-linked diseases more often than females because females with their second X chromosome could be carriers of recessive sex-linked genetic diseases. Uh, males can't be carriers, right? If they have a, a, a disease gene on either the X or the Y chromosome, they're gonna have the disease. Whereas, again, females have the, op well, the option, I guess, of, of perhaps having a normal copy of the gene on the other X that's dominant. So that was talked about in Chapter 15 as well. Um, bring this up. There's some chromosomal abnormalities that can occur. Uh, Non-disjunction during meiosis can lead to gametes having either an extra or one too few chromosomes. And of course, if let's say a, an egg cell with an extra 21 chromosome is fertilized by a normal sperm cell, that's going to lead to a zygote with three number 21 chromosomes. That's trisomy 21, it's called, and that would lead to Down syndrome. But there's other chromosomal abnormalities. There's deletions of parts of chromosomes. There's uh, translocations where a piece will break off and reattach to a different one. Uh, inversions where a piece breaks, flips, and reattaches on the same chromosome. Um, so all of these involve dozens, maybe hundreds of genes. And so these are usually lethal um, because typically it's got to be Goldilocks, right? Just right. I think that was the bulk of, of chapter 15. Um Chapter 16 and 17 were big ones. Uh, 16 was the DNA chapter, basically. So it started with some 
uh, descriptions of experiments that led to the discovery of DNA as the stuff, right? That, that DNA was the genetic material, not protein, which was hypothesized to maybe be the genetic material uh, at, at one time. Um, next, DNA structure was talked about. And so just remember nucleic acids, the monomers are nucleotides. You've got a phosphate, a sugar, and a base, a nitrogen base. Those are the three parts of a nucleotide monomer. DNA nucleotides use the sugar deoxyribose. RNA nucleotides use the sugar ribose. That difference is why there's different bases between RNA and DNA. DNA, you've got your A, G, C, and T, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymine. RNA, you've got A, G, C's, and U's, uracil, takes the place of T. Uh, just, like, uh, just like thymine, uracil is... Uh, oops, lost my train. Just like uracil... Uh, or just like thymine, uracil pairs with adenine. It is a, a pyrimidine. It's a single ringed base. Uh, so the, the, the pairing rules basically are the same. It's just when you're, when you're writing an RNA strand, uh, the sequence of nucleotides, you got to use use wherever you'd want to put it to. Um, and then DNA replication, I guess, was the last big thing from chapter 16. So normally the DNA is packed into chromosomes, um, wraps around histone proteins to help it condense. So when it loosens up into chromatin, that's when we can copy the DNA. Uh, if you remember cell cycle, IPMATC, DNA replication happens during interphase, specifically S phase of interphase. And, you know, you've got a whole bunch of players involved. I suggest you go to our notes uh, and look at the animations that, that we looked at um, or, or the images. And then on that Raven and Johnson website, that's where I get all the animations that we look at in class. There's, uh, there's a real good one for this as well. So helicase breaks the hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides, splits the strands. DNA polymerase, the enzyme, adds complementary nucleotides, A's and T's, G's and C's. And then DNA ligase basically reforms all the bonds, seals everything back up. Um, Topoisomerase, right, works ahead of the replication form. So as helicase is unzipping and the strands are separating, it tends to want to over-twist, the double helix does, ahead of the replication fork. And so topoisomerase, remember, breaks, relieves that torsional stress and reattaches. Um, you've got single-stranded single binding proteins to prevent the strands from coming back together. But then, you know, the, the, the added wrinkle, the added detail... Well, there was a couple things. One, your new strands have to be anti-parallel, right? Just like the original strands were, five prime to three prime this way, the other one five prime to three prime that way. They're anti-parallel. Um, because of that, the leading strand, right, DNA polymerase three, can continuously make the leading strand. The other strand has to be made in little backward fragments, right, the Okazaki fragments. And so that's the lagging strand, and it's more complicated. So basically what will happen is primase will lay down an RNA primer because DNA poly-3 can't start making DNA from scratch. The primer's laid down, DNA poly-3 will connect it to where you left off. DNA poly-1 will go back, replace the primer with DNA nucleotides. Ligase seals everything back up. But again, your lagging strand is made in those backward Okazaki fragments. Uh, it's semi-conservative, this replication, meaning that each strand of the copy is made up of half old and half new DNA nucleotides. So we call that semi-conservative. And I believe that is... 
Yeah, that's as good of a quick summary as we can get. Chapter 17, the other biggie was gene expression. So this is when you start with a DNA strand. Then you make you copy that into an mRNA, a messenger RNA complementary copy. Um, every three letters is called a codon. And same thing, you know, if you have a G in the DNA, it's a C in the mRNA. If you have an A in the DNA, remember, it's a U in the mRNA. A T in the DNA goes with an A, C with a G, just like before. So you make your mRNA, and that's transcription, right? Gene expression is made up of transcription followed by translation. All transcription is is making an mRNA copy of a gene. Uh, there's a promoter that says, hey, here's where the gene starts. There's a terminate, terminator sequence uh, that says the gene is done. Uh, in prokaryotes, this happens in the nucleus, or excuse me, in the cytosol, because there is no nucleus, but in eukaryotic cells, the mRNA is made in the nucleus. And before it's allowed to leave the nucleus, it gets processed. So there's a five prime cap, three prime poly A tail that's attached. Those interfering introns, which are the non-coding junk parts, are cut out and recycled. The excellent exons that are left in coding are joined together. And that final mRNA leaves the nucleus through a nuclear pore out to the cytosol where it finds a ribosome for translation. Again, that Raven and Johnson textbook website has a really good animation of translation. Um, basically, your mRNA, again, is read in groups of three nucleotides. Those are your codons. The ribosome is made of rRNA, ribosomal RNA. That's the stru structure of the ribosome. That really just gives the process a place to happen. Uh, the tRNAs are the workhorses, right? So the transfer RNAs, those were those crazy shaped things, amino acid on top, anticodon, right, at the bottom. And the anticodon matches the codon. And that amino acid is put in that spot in the growing polypeptide protein chain. There was a table that we looked at. Remember, if you give the mRNA codon, let's say CUG, find C here, U, they intersect, third letter G. Oh, the amino acid proline, right, is what that codon codes for. So this happens one at a time, over and over, hundreds of thousands of amino acids uh, put together to equal a protein. They get added one at a time in this way. Um, that's the bulk of it for the process. Now, chapter 17 also talked about mutations. So if we change one nucleotide in the DNA, that's going to change one nucleotide in the mRNA. Doesn't mean we're going to change the amino acid. It could be a silent mutation because remember the wobble in the code, like CU anything will code for a proline. So if that third nucleotide is the one that changed, you might get the same amino acid in the same place, making the same exact protein, shape the same, works the same. Um, or it could cause a, a different amino acid to be put in that spot, which may not be a big deal might not be in a crucial part of the protein, um, would be lethal, right? If it changes the shape of the protein and it's non-functional and it's that important. So it could go from no change to a neutral who cares change to maybe bad, right? It creates a disease situation or it could be lethal. Um, you can add or delete a nucleotide, one or two, and that would be then a frame shift mutation. So you throw off your groupings of three, right, which is typically devastating. That protein won't be anything like it's supposed to be. Um, remember, AUG is a start codon, and then there's three stop codons. Well, if you have a frame shift, you probably messed up your stop, and you're just going to keep on translating whatever happens to be downstream. Um, so that protein, like I said, probably nothing like it should be. All right. So, yeah, takes us to chapter 18, regulation of gene expression. Um, I would say one of the, the major things 
from chapter 18 would be those operons. Remember the lac operon and the trip operon? Um, this is how we control gene expression. It's not like a cell. Number one, a cell doesn't express all the genes that it has. Every cell has the same, in humans, 46 chromosomes worth of genetic information. But different cells use different parts of the genome, right? Different recipes out of that big cookbook that every cell has in common. That's number one. Number two, even the genes that, let's say, a liver cell does express, doesn't express them 24 7. Right? We've got to maintain homeostasis. So we need things to be a certain way. Sometimes we need to express certain genes, sometimes we don't. So we've got to be able to turn them on and off. The lac operon and the trip operon, uh, it's only in bacteria because it's simpler in prokaryotes. And so we understand it better. We use it as an example. Uh, this is a mechanism for turning genes off and on. So I actually do want to show you this one slide from our chapter 18 notes. Again, I've tried not to do this a whole lot. I know that it's helpful, but I mean, we already did it when we, when we learned this stuff for the first time. Can't reteach the whole course in a few videos. But right here, this is the DNA right at the top here. And here are the genes that we want to turn on or off. Now, this is the trip operon. And these genes code for enzymes that will make the amino acid tryptophan. It's an essential amino acid that has to be, well, I shouldn't use the word essential. It's an important amino acid for making a lot of proteins. So typically, RNA polymerase, right, there's a promoter uh, that the RNA poly recognizes and it slides down and it transcribes these genes. That mRNA would then get translated into those enzymes and we'd be making tryptophan. What happens when tryptophan is in excess, either because we've made plenty or we might find ourselves uh, with a bunch that we've ingested, uh, that tryptophan, right, so the actual final product sticks to this repressor protein changes its shape, allows it to stick to this operator region and block transcription. So excess tryptophan, why make more? It has a way of blocking the transcription of the genes that would make enzymes to make tryptophan. Once all the tryptophan is used up, even this tryptophan, repressor goes back to its original shape where it can't block let me go back to making these enzymes. Now, this is a repressible operon because it's always on until you turn it off. The lac operon is an inducible operon, meaning it's always off until you turn it on. So there's genes here that make enzymes to digest uh, lactose, sugar found in milk. Um, if there's no lactose around, why make enzymes to break down something that's not there? So the repressor normally has the shape where it can block. If lactose is present, it binds to the repressor, changes its shape in such a way that it can no longer block. Now RNA poly slides down, transcribes these genes, they'll get translated, and we will be digesting the lactose. Even these eventually... And once all the lactose is gone, repressor goes back to its original shape, sticks to the operator, and shuts everything down. So again, this is called an inducible operon because it's always off until it's turned off. So that was, like I said, probably the, the main thing from chapter 18. Let me see what else. The operon stuff. Um, we discussed in chat with our chapter 20 projects, if you remember, our biotechnology projects. Um, another way of controlling gene expression is by affecting the mRNAs. So doing transcription, but then there were what we call non-coding RNAs or little n, little c RNAs. Uh, specifically, microRNAs and siRNAs, small interfering RNAs that can actually stick to mRNAs and prevent them from getting translated. So that's another layer of control when it comes to gene expression. Um, remember that the way that cells differentiate 
aka become different types of cells, is by differential gene expression. So in other words, the zygote, right? Sperm and egg fuse, 46 chromosomes. Zygote goes through IPMATC, cloning process over and over. All the daughter cells have the identical same 46 chromosomes, assuming everything went right. RNA, or excuse me, DNA polymerase three can proofread, can fix mistakes, but it's not foolproof. So what happens is certain types of cells will express certain genes and not others, and that will allow them to become different. And so as the embryo develops, we get different cells expressing different parts of the genome, and that's how we eventually get muscle cells and skin cells and liver cells and nerve cells. Also mentioned in chapter 18 was uh, that basically mutations in proto-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes lead to cells becoming cancer cells. Now, we talked about that back when we talked about the cell cycle, but it is mentioned again in chapter 18. So maybe no sense repeating that. All right, so I think there's maybe one more video to go. Uh, some virus talk, appropriately. Biotechnology, a little bit about genomes. Uh, and then if you think about it, what we did was, uh, well, we went on to classification and we learned a little bit about bacteria, prokaryotes. So that's not directly fair game on the test. Neither are the evolution chapters, 22 to 25, uh, or the ecology chapters, which I guess were what, 52 through 56. So after the next video, that's kind of it for the content that at least the College Board is saying you're responsible for for the test. Um, again, I won't ramble too much more, but just remember the test is made up of two FRQs, free response questions. 25 minutes for one, 15 minutes for the other. And what's that add up to? 40 I'll have to double check. I know they give you a five minute upload period after each question. Uh, so, and I think the whole thing's 45 minutes. So maybe it's 20 and 15, but they're very similar to the questions that I've been giving you for practice. You know, you're going to have to analyze data in a graph, in a table. You're going to have to have some background knowledge. And that's what these little vids are for that I'm making is to refresh, you know, the basic concepts. Um, you're going to have to probably not make a graph um probably not uh but you certainly will have to analyze them you'll have to make predictions you'll have to justify predictions that either you yourself make or that the scientists in the question make so it's going to be a really strange experience this year but having all this background knowledge in your head is definitely going to be helpful definitely worth your time studying um so that's it i will see you all very soon.